Hello, and welcome to the Massachusetts Farm to Table podcast, where we explore the fields, kitchens, and stories that make the Massachusetts food scene so special. I'm your host, Nissa Gadbois. Each week, we'll connect with farmers, food producers, and the community that makes the Commonwealth's food scene so vibrant. Join me as we meet the passionate farmers, food producers, and chefs who are shaping the farm to table movement right here in Massachusetts. Hello and welcome back to the Massachusetts Farm to Table podcast. This is part one of a two-part podcast where I sit down with Lindsay Baird of Oak and Ash Farm in Belchertown, where she and her family farm seven and a half acres using regenerative practices. They have a market garden, pick your own flowers and herbs, and they raise pasture poultry for meat and eggs. I hope you'll enjoy this episode and come back next week to listen to part two of my podcast with Lindsay Baird. to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, can you start by telling us a little bit about your farm and how you get started? Um, sure. So my husband, Matt, and I um, started our farm about 10 years ago. We were looking for a place to build a house, but we really wanted to have a farm as well. Um, so we found our property. It's about seven and a half acres. And when we bought it, it was entirely forested. Uh, So we didn't really know what to do. So we kind of cleared just what we needed for um, a house. And then my husband read the Holistic Orchard book and started to put in some orchard trees. So we have a mixed orchard. That's the oldest thing on the farm. Um, And originally we were trying to figure out what can we do that would, you know, kind of go off of that idea. And we decided we wanted to open a craft distillery. So we took a course and learned as much as we could about it. And we're all set to open a craft distillery. And then the town was not okay with that. Uh, Just the way we were zoned, it just, it wasn't going to work out. So we were a little dejected and not really sure what to do. Um, We were um, collecting maple sap and doing maple syrup, Um, but we really wanted to have a farm, but we didn't want to sort of clear cut our property. So my husband, came across no dig gardening and then through that he learned about regenerative agriculture and then once we got on that it was like full steam ahead um so we have a um three quarters of an acre is market garden um which we do a small scale csa and then this year is the first year i'll be running a market um i'll be i'll be doing a farmer's market out of it but the rest of it we really didn't want to clear cut it. So we manage it as forest. We still do our maple syrup. Um, but we have this rule where anywhere we clear trees, we replace it with new trees or other permaculture things. So most of our, um, tr- most of our trees that we've cleared beyond our market garden, we're on a north slope too, which makes it very hard to grow things. Um, so our market garden is tiered to sort of slow water from running off the property but anywhere we've cleared trees we replaced it with polyculture tree rows and then in between we have pasture and that's where we run our meat birds Um, and we've allowed them to sort of build their own pasture so we really just like cleared the trees ground the stumps down let them run through it and then just spread seed beyond them so we just have this focus of you know trying to do the right things for nature so if we're gonna again if we're gonna clear something let's replace it with food for people and animals um creating habitat and you know we're both we love we're both nerds (laughs) sort of to begin with so we really have a focus on like we're trying to learn as much as we can and then we're really passionate about sharing that with other people um and we're trying to sort of prove this model of you can produce a lot of food you can have these really really prolific small scale food systems 
that are also regenerative and you can feed a lot of people and animals in a, in a small space. So do you, either of you have a farming background or are you first generation? We are first generation. I mean, we have sort of a homesteading background, I would say more than anything. Um, I have more of a farming background than my husband. Um, I grew up on a large piece of property. We didn't keep animals of any kind, but we always had a very large garden. Um, my dad was Italian and like that was always very big in his family. And so we had this huge garden and I literally from the time I was can remember, I just loved it. Like I loved being able to go out and pick strawberries and, and pick asparagus in the springtime. And by the time I was about 10 or 11, I had researched and put in my first herb garden. Um, and then by the time I was maybe 15, I had taken over the, the garden full time, like the full production of the garden. So I would, you know, was very into the planning of it and the planting. Um, and then I also worked at Davis Farmland, uh, which is in Sterling and where I grew up. And I um, got a lot of experience with animals there, which is where I said I would never have animals. But <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. As a father <laughs> and as a parent, I've learned you don't ever say never because <laughs> here I am. It's like, hmm, I could probably do some sheep and and some <laughs> some cows, <laughs> you know, all, all these things. But um, and then my husband, he grew up, he's a very short distance back from Ireland and his uh, mother's side. And his family came over during the potato famine and settled in Down East Maine. And they had a massive blueberry um, farm. And over the generations, they sort of trickled down to Massachusetts um, but he, his grandmother has a camp up in Maine and, um, she's since passed, but he used to spend every summer there with her and really learned to like eat off of the land. Um, they did, he did a lot of hunting and fishing and, you know, foraging for a lot of things. And his, um, paternal grandparents always had a massive garden with lots of canning things. So that really sort of shaped what we wanted like from the beginning we just sort of wanted like this Willy Wonka experience of being able to like walk out into the yard and and just pick things and and we're getting pretty close to that at this point but that's that's the background we came from and it's me I'm more um I wanted to be a chef so I've always been very driven by food um I wrote a cookbook it is not published yet <laughs> which is another story but um, my passion is food. So, so much of, yes, I'm, again, now I'm more looking at it from a regenerative standpoint, but it always centers from this just like absolute love of eating really good food, like food that I just picked and I'm turning it into a dish, like everything comes from that. Yeah, it's incredible. I um, can't remember which one of the guests that was on recently, we were talking about the nutrient density Mm -hmm. of food that's just been picked in ground that's really healthy tastes completely different than something that's grown elsewhere and maybe was picked five days ago seven days ago shipped on a truck and even now people are surprised when they taste if they come to the farm and they taste a tomato yep. that was picked this morning as opposed to something they bought in the store and they're, why why does that taste so different it's because it still has a lot of its nutrients it loses them so fast yeah but really good real food that you just harvested it's the best thing <laughs> just so good it, it is and I think I think having grown up that way influenced a lot of that because you know you if you grow up that way and you're used to real food and then you sort of go out into the world and you're buying food from a grocery store and you're going, what is this? And I get to the point now where like, I, I always say my children are so spoiled and they don't really know how spoiled they are because they, everything they eat is so, I mean, especially now that I have children, um, it's not as much, I don't care about me anymore. It's like their kids get all the fruit. They get all the things because my focus is of course going to be on them. And I want everything that they eat to be as healthy as possible and to be as nutrient dense as possible. 
Um, and, and, you know, eating seasonally and my kids are obsessed with peas and I'm buying peas from a grocery store in like February and I can't, I, I will taste them and they taste almost moldy to me. Mm. They don't taste like real food. It tastes like fake food. Um, and I do notice that things that they'll eat sort of out of the garden, they won't necessarily eat, you know, the rest of the season. So we really, we really try to focus on, on eating fresh and then, and doing our, our preservation. Cause it's, it's just such a different experience. <laughs> it's a different experience. I'm going to out my, one of my sons in law right now. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Um, but when he didn't grow up eating fresh foods and, and things like that at the level that we do here. Yeah. Um, and he thought he didn't like vegetables. And then he was here. And, and the, when you mentioned peas, it reminded me of this particular um, experience. We had just picked bucket loads of peas and we pulled one of the five gallon buckets into the house. Um, and we were gonna start dividing it up to preserve it so we could um, have it for later. My son-in-law took one. And he's like, "Oh, that's good." And another, and another, and and then he snuck out a whole bunch of them to take home. And my daughter, my daughter was like, "Mom, he he watched him fill this shirt with peas, and he broke <laughs> home. I don't know if he had them still in his shirt or if he had put them in a container or what he did, but he lo loved them so much. It was such a great experience for him." Um, yeah, but I was, you can't be mad, right? <laughs> no, no, no. You're, awesome. you're like, hey, we're good. That, yeah. It, welcome. It, welcome to, welcome to real food. It's very yeah. different, isn't it? It is very different. Um, we noticed too, that, um, meat was very different when we raised those animals ourselves. Um, I remember the first batch of pork that came back from the processor, um, and it wasn't pink. It was not pink meat. I, I'm looking at my husband. I'm looking at these packages, and I'm like, "That's what, that's what raising them on on dirt and grass and and roots and things does. Is so rich and so different. Um, so the the whole farming experience has blown my mind. We're we're first generation too, so um, it's, it's we um. So we do meat birds and this will be our third year and there's no other way to describe them. And I, I can talk a little bit more about this because we're really, we've really sort of gotten it down with the meat birds and I'm very, I'm very passionate about the way we do it. And I'm very um, happy to share that knowledge with other people because, but when you taste them, there is like a succulence to it. You can overcook that chicken and it will still be so succulent and moist and it just tastes like real food. And I do find a lot of a lot of our customers um, that are the most appreciative of the way that we do things, particularly for the taste, come from Europe. Um, we have this um, this man who did our CSA and he is um, from Italy originally. And we gave him our first batch of strawberries and he just took a bite and closed his eyes and went, I remember when strawberries used to taste like this. And he says, I won't buy them from the grocery store because, you know, where I grew up in Italy, this is what a strawberry tastes like. You know, it was probably still warm from the sun. Mm -hmm. um, and same thing, you know, you have people from other countries who want chicken to taste like chicken. Um, and even though we're raising a Cornish cross, which is your traditional sort of like big breasted chicken, the way we're raising them where they're out on pasture and they're healthy and they're, they're fit. They literally like can run mm -hmm. after you know their food. And, and it gets to the point where we're pouring food on the ground and they don't even care about that. They just want to go forage for, you know, they're excited because they're on a new set of grass and there's new bugs there and there's new things for them to eat. Um, and it shows in the food. So, you know, our, our sort of motto is like, if we're going to raise an animal to sustain ourselves, I want that animal to have the best life possible. And I want it to have one bad day. And I don't even want it to know <laughs> that it happened. I just want it to be as quick and painless. And like, that should be, you know, 
that makes me feel better about eating it because it's, it's, it's such a, it's, I definitely want to eat it. It's definitely much better. Yeah. Um, you know, and nothing goes to waste and, and all of that, you know, we use every, every bit of it. So it's, it's, um, the taste again, once you get sort of used to it, it's kind of like you get hooked on it and you can't really go back to eating food that doesn't taste like food. <laughs> so yes. you're new to Belchertown. How, how have you, um, found the community in terms of supporting your work? Um, the, as a whole, incredibly supportive. Um, I've learned a lot of hard lessons in the process, um, that, you know, food and farming is very tied to politics, whether you want it to be or not. Um, and a farm is a small business and that is also tied to politics. Um, but Belchertown, as I understand it over the last decade plus, since we have ourselves been part of this wave, has been this wave of just new buildings and lots of young families coming in. Um, and they are hungry, literally, pun intended, for really good local food, local businesses. They want it. But Belchertown is one, a massive land area. It, it's the largest landmass town in the Commonwealth, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, so it's huge. And you do have primarily a lot of farms. What comes with that is people who have, I'm, try, I'm trying to be as understanding about this as possible. You have a lot of people who are multi-generations on their farm and they are not always understanding or sympathetic to the cost prohibited <laughs> the cost pro prohibition of starting a new farm mm -hmm. and um they're not always welcoming and eager to have you come in and they will sort of look down on you you know again i'm seven and a half acres and i'm farming less than that i'm still producing a lot of you know, a lot of things, but I'm working on a very small scale because that's what's achievable. And they look down on me because I'm not some monoculture farm with a giant tractor. I also am not working off of land that was given to me. I had to purchase this land and turn it into a farm. And that is a massive, massive undertaking. I mean, my husband and I say all the time that if we knew we were going to do this kind of farming, we wouldn't have bought a forested piece of land. We would have looked for a piece of cleared land that had been sort of degraded over time and tried to regenerate that because that just makes a lot of sense. Um, again, we're still proving the model, but we made our work 10 times harder. So the old school farmers don't really get it. And I understand that. Um, they are going off of sort of the model that they they grew up with and they just think that that is how farming goes. But I had a really interesting conversation with um, an older gentleman from American Farmland Trust and he made a really good point. He said, well, you call it a regenerative farm where I'm from, that's just old school farming. So he's like, you're really doing actually more traditional farms because a traditional farm had a great symbiotic relationship between the animals and the orchards and the fields, everything worked together, nothing got wasted. And you worked a little more in conjunction with nature on a smaller scale. No, you weren't farming a hundred acres. You were farming something that was more manageable for one or you know a small family to, to maintain. Um, so I thought that was a really good point. So we actually have a, you know, if we can remind sort of the older generation that Actually, we're we're farming really close to what your your great grandparents probably were doing. You know, I think it it helps a little bit, but I've also been able to find a really amazing network of other small farmers. A lot of them are also female farmers, mm -hmm. um, and I've really fostered those relationships, and I cherish them because you know we're all doing different things, and we're all just trying to do our best and um you know we all farm a little differently and that's okay um but we're there to support each other and kind of you know help each other out because it's it's a lot <laughs> it's a lot of work so your your experience with 
um, support from other farmers sounds like it's been very mixed. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I agree. Having having other farmers who share your vision is super important for being able to continue. Um, is there a group that you know of that, um, like a formalized group that you know of, or are these just other farmers you happen to meet? These are just other farmers um, I happen to meet. I'm, I am always, I'm one of those people, I've always been very creative and I work better with other people. I need other people to bounce ideas off of. I thrive on a community of people who are like, like I, I want the discussion. I don't want to just bury my head in the sand and say, this is just how I'm going to do this. And, you know, to hell with anybody else's right. opinion. Of it. Sometimes I can be a little bit like that, but I want, I want the engagement of other, other people because you can never really learn and grow and expand if you're not taking it in. So I, um, when I worked at a, you know, corporate job many years ago, I was on the chamber of commerce in town, um, or in the city, I should say, um, I was in Worcester and, I learned that, you know, reaching out to the other small businesses is such a great way to, to just help each other. It's amazing how, um, you know, just reaching out. Cause sometimes even people might think like, oh, they're my competition. And then if you reach out and have a conversation with them and you go, oh, actually we, we're not competition. We're, we're in this together. It's, it's us against, you know, large corporations. Um, so what can we do to support each other? Whether it's, you know, hey, what are we charging prices for this product or that product? Or, you know, if you're going to do this, then I'll do this and kind of staying out of each other's territory. Um, I just, I, I sort of reached out and, and found these other farmers. I will give, um, to give a little shout out, uh, Jen Turner, who is the head of our select board in town. I call her the great connector because literally this woman is constantly seeking what she can do to help improve the town, help improve the small businesses in town. And she's just meeting people all the time. So she'll, her always at some point during a conversation, you'll hear from her, you know who you should meet. And so that is actually how I met most of these women. So I reached out to them, but Jen often connected me to a lot of them, which is, it's so great to have that, that person in town who's yeah. really seeking to connect everybody so we can work together. Yeah. That's a real gift. Wow. Um, to, yeah. Wow. That's super. Um, so you mentioned permaculture and regenerative ag. So how did you all come to that path? Um, slowly. <laughs> um, there are a lot of things we're sort of looking at again now, because we didn't know we were going to be on the regenerative ag path when we started. And if we did, we would have done things very differently. So we're doing a lot of, well, we wouldn't have done that if we had known we were going to do this later, like undoing a lot of hard work we've already done. Um, but it started with, again, like my husband, my husband has a full-time job, which is frustrating but also important it allows us to really allows us the freedom to to take big leaps and say okay we're gonna spend the money to put this thing in um because we're not completely dependent on you know the income of that i'm making off of the farm but he started with reading the holistic orchard and was just very interested in that he is um he's a hunter He's again, spent so much time in nature and he really helped me sort of understand hunters in a different way. Um, but he's seen nature in a way that I've, I've never seen it and experienced it because, you know, sitting in a tree stand for hours and hours and hours, you, he, he observes, he takes it all in. And so he also, again, is very interested in educating himself. We, we call ourselves like we're great collectors of knowledge but in skills like we're always trying to add on another thing so it started with the orchard and then he found uh charles dowding which is probably familiar to a lot of people on youtube no dig gardening 
and then he wanted to learn more about regenerative farming. And so it kind of just was like a trickle effect. And then once he pulled me in, I was like, absolutely. Um, so now it's gotten to the point where he does like he has the bigger general view of like what, what the, what we're doing on the farm mm -hmm. from he's doing, practicing interesting things with um, pollarding and coppicing trees as a form of orchard management. He wants to see if you pollard an, a maple tree, can you get it to grow bigger, quicker so that you can, you can produce maple syrup? Um, you know, can you, we do lots of, um, we do lots of wattle fences around here. So we're like, we're combining all these different like methods and testing them out, but it now has taken it where I can look at an area and say, okay, what's, let's look at what's going on in nature around it. Take our cues from that. What's growing already? What, what does this want to be? Mm -hmm. And how do we make that, <clears throat> how do we work with that concept and make it better where we can produce more food again, either for ourselves or for wildlife. Um, and how can we improve upon it? So we just kind of take that. And once you get the basics of like the regenerative principles down, it's so easy to just immediately apply it to an area. You know, you're observing, you're taking it in and then you're saying, okay, how can I make this that much better? But still, you know, still, keeping nature in mind and, and improving the soil in the process. So um, we've put in a lot of our um, tree rows, our polyculture tree rows. Um, they're mixes of like wild plums and we've got our nitrogen fixers and berries. We had a lot of berries growing on the property when we came here. So we just said, okay, well, we're really good at growing berries already. Um, part of why we bought this property was there were wild blueberries growing on the property already. So since we have moved here and cleared land and clear, given it a little more light and also brought in thing like, things like aronia berries, mm -hmm. um, our native pollinator population has exploded. And because of that, our, our berry production has exploded because there's so many more native bees. We have tons and tons and tons of mason bees and big giant fat bumblebees um and they are working their little tushies off <laughs> during <laughs> orchard season. they're just everywhere i my blue orchard mason bees have become my favorite favorite thing in the world they are so cute and they're very docile and they're very shy if you go too close they'll like hide oh. but um they're amazing little workers and it's it is amazing because we have thousands of them and there are bees. They don't have the range of a honeybee. They they can only go so far. So those are our bees. And we have allowed that population to just explode because there's just so much here for them to eat. So it's it's been really amazing to watch that happen. That's been like my favorite, that's been like my favorite side effect, so to speak, of um doing farming the way we're doing it is yeah. is seeing seeing how it's benefited the native population. This episode of the Massachusetts Farm to Table podcast is brought to you by Renaissance Farms Permaculture and the shop at Renaissance Farms. Please visit them online and while you're there, sign up for the weekly newsletter and get 15% off your next order from the shop. Each edition of the newsletter includes farm news, articles, recipes, and updates on upcoming classes, courses, workshops, and special events. Subscribers also receive exclusive subscriber-only discounts each week. Links are in the show notes. Thank you for joining us on another delicious journey through the Massachusetts Farm to Table podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to follow us on social media and join our Facebook group where you can join the local Farm to Table movement. Links are in the show notes. If you have any questions, feedback, or suggestions for future guests, we'd love to hear from you. Please drop us a line at massachusettsfarmtotable at gmail.com. Until next time, 
Remember to eat local, support your farmers, and keep the farm-to-table movement moving. Thanks for listening.